Well, thanks, Julie. I hope that the recording is going okay from here on. Uh, welcome, everybody that is joining the webinar again this evening uh, from all well, around Australia and apparently also international. So I, am, um, I have many hats on, and I'm just going to show the next slide because um, it just gives a bit of an overview. Oh, sorry, I have already technical problems. <laughs> um, so my, my background is uh, animal and equine science. I've done uh, various uh, undergrad and postgrad studies in um, particular focusing on horse nutrition. I've worked with um, Tor red horses looking at um, uh, the transition from, um, from a grain diet to pasture and vice versa and how that affects the gut health. So I have a very uh, microbiology background as well. I've done calcium and phosphor balances in Shetland ponies um, in the Netherlands for another PhD student. So that was an internship. And um, recently I, I, I finalized my PhD, which, uh, which is this um, kind of captured by this photo where you see me uh, recording animal of a horse behavior, so particular diet selection uh, behavior, where I was particularly interested looking at um, the the role of smell and taste and texture on um, on the preferences of horses, but also how this links to the post ingestive feedback. So, are horses nutritional wise? Can they pick up? up on certain nutrients such as energy and protein. And that is also something that I'm going to talk about today in this in this webinar. Um, so I've done I have a very keen interest in academic um, in, in science and, and teaching. Um, but I also started my consulting um, when I arrived in Australia, so MBA Equine Services. Um, it consists of three components, so the equine nutrition, uh, the property and pasture, which really kind of was a, a continuum of um, my interest in, um, in gut health and um, the overall health and it didn't make sense to only look at the diet and, and I soon expanded that to an environmental component and that has also then um, actually further evolved to using certain principles such as permaculture, holistic management, um, behavioral education and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the the behave, um, behavioral education for human, animal, vegetation, and ecosystem management. Um, and I'm going to give some inf more information about it because it's a quite big research group from Utah State that mainly has um, looked at diet selection in, uh, in ruminants. And they've done a little bit in horses, and I'm going to touch on that uh, as well. And then, ob obviously, my, um, my research as, um, as well. So, and then, uh, well, as a side, on the sideline, I'm also very interested in, in, in sporting. I mean, that's where my passion started for horses. So I'm a dressers coach, I'm a judge, um, and, um, and I just bought myself two warm bloods and started competing again, which is, uh, which is very nice. So I'm kind of really in the sport as well as trying to um, take care of horses at home and, uh, and, and, and be in the academic side as well. So many hats on, um, and today I'm talking about um, why pasture is a pharmacy, and I think uh, it gets a lot of attention. And I just want to say up front that um, I come from an academic background, and so I want to really focus on the scientific side of, you know, of, of, of plants. Uh, what do they offer animals, and how does that affect the behavior? I'm no shape or form a herbalist or somebody that is um, that has studied. Um, um, anything related to toxicology or anything like that. But I have kind of developed, um, um, well, I've kind of studied um, different segments to kind of create a bigger picture. I'm a bigger picture person, and, and, and if I'm interested in certain things, I will dig into it deeper, but always trying to find evidence-based uh, evidence uh, research that can, can support it. But a lot that we're talking about is still, um, is, is still well, anecdotal a lot and is not, has not been studied in, in horses extensively. And even if we look at other animals in the wild, um, uh, it, it still is a very new field, and I think that uh, it is very exciting, and I would like to see much more happening in it. Um, so just some, you know, some, um, some disclaimers there that I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not um, a full plant person, so don't ask me any any serious questions about uh, the chemical composition of everything, um, but happy to, to, to find that out uh, for you. So 
why so it's going to be three segments. So we're going to talk first a little bit about um, uh, the components that uh, that we find in in pasture plants and in for the trees and in shrubs and then we're going to talk about the self-medication uh, and self-supplementation behavior. And then I want to finish with the, the applied part where how can we facilitate self-supplementation and medication by, uh, by our pasture management and also supplementary feeding. I will also touch a little bit on that. So we don't have a lot of time. So, um, so if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to um, um, answer them in a separate email and I will also try to give some more information about certain um, studies or where you can find more information. So why pasture is a pharmacy and as you can see um, when, when you look at what, what horses could eat, um, mainly we focus on the grasses and we've, I've talked about a lot that, that we consider horses mainly uh, primarily grazing herbivores but uh, they can eat substantial amounts of browse, so trees and shrubs and forbs. Um, of course, with pasture, we also um, include the legume side of things, and all of these, and all of these plants um, will be part of a diet. If you look at feral horses, and I've, I've highlighted it many times, you will see that um, depending if it's winter or summer or what is happening with the seasons and also the location around the world, animals will um, typically graze around and, and, and um, around 19% and then 10% browsing, but it could be 50-50, like in, in the UK it has shown, and also in, in New Mexico and uh, in the US, that uh, the horses can browse up to 50% um, during, during winter or even all year round. So uh, it really depends, I think, on the, on the location. I think, I think it also depends a lot about the, about the herd and the knowledge of the herd about um, using different types of food. And then we're going to talk about that, which is the social and, and inheritable kind of interactions uh, where, where we see that animals learn about um, what to eat and not to eat. And that's um, very fascinating and unfortunately not studied a lot in horses, but there's quite a bit of information in, in ruminants such as sheep, goats, and, in, and cattle. So why it's a pharmacy? Because it has all kinds of components. So we can divide in all of these, so in tree leaves and in grasses and in legumes, we can find pr plant primary components, which is obviously um, the, the nutrients uh, that animals need to take daily to, to meet their requirements for, you know, to, um, to regenerate their cells, obviously, to keep homeostasis, as we call. So it's the internal, um, the internal balance that we, we, we need to um, uh, keep daily and we obviously need to eat daily. So nutrients is the primary component, which is very important, and then we have the plant secondary components or metabolites, which we kind of refer to as toxins. And I will get back to that a little bit more because people get confused between toxins and when something is toxic or poisonous. And that includes, for instance, your um, uh, chemical components such as alkaloid, tannins, saponins. Those may be some that you that, that you are familiar with. For instance, oxalate. If you are living in a, in a, if you're dealing with a very tropical pasture, you will obviously have heard of oxalate and how that affects the animal. We're going to talk about that as well. And then we have flavors, or what we call the hedonic value. So something that can be very pleasant. That's pretty much how we generally like to eat our, uh, and and how we respond to chocolate or something that is very uh, sweet or fatty or has protein, such as um, cheeses. So Flavors, even for animals, first we never really considered that animals may have a hedonic um, experience that just animals eat because they just want to survive. But we see that, um, that behaviors, foraging behaviors of herbivores, and I'm focusing particularly on herbivores, but we see it in, in primates and in, in other species as well, that they can eat for a pleasure. So for instance, I know that monkeys um, um, can eat fruits that have been fermented a bit for alcohol, so uh, like us. We like our wine, they like their fermented fruits. So smell, taste, but also texture. We also like some, to eat something because of its texture. So those are all things that we need to consider and uh, they all provide um, important components um, that either help the animal for survival or gives the animal a pleasant experience or can have even beneficial, um, beneficial um, effects to help prevent or to um, 
to reduce some of, of, of illnesses and diseases that we're uh, going to talk about a little bit a little bit in more detail. But first, a little bit more about plant secondary compounds because um, they are produced by plants in the second second metabolism. So it's, it, it is um, not directly involved in the growth and development of the plant, but it's it's to kind of support the survival. And so um, first, we were thinking that they may not really have a function, but we see that they are they are quite crucial for plants in the survival. Uh, there are many, many, many compounds. You can see here a couple of uh, chemical uh, structures. If you open a book, if you are really, really interested in plant secondary compounds, you have a bit, bit of this herbal medicine uh, interest, but, but more on the toxicology side of things, then uh, you can find books and, and they will go in much more detail about all these compounds. Um, I'm going to list a couple as well, just to give the bigger picture. Um, and what we also need to, to know um, is that these compounds, they are not standalone. They generally are linked to building blocks um, in plants, so either by amino acids or by uh, starches, carbohydrates. So they generally are in a bound form, and, and that makes it also very tricky, particular um, when we talk about oxalate, where it is bound and, um, and, and can bind with calcium and then it, it is not so well absorbed by, by, by the animal. And there are other, way, other proteins as well that we're going to talk about that, does the, that, that are doing the same um, with a secondary compound and then it blocks this absorption or it re reduces the bioavailability, as we say. So it's all quite complex and, and each compound have its own kind of um, um, molecular structure and building blocks and, and how it works in the body or what it does in the body. Um, but what we first were thinking uh, when we we're, um, were studying sec secondary compounds is that we were thinking that they were uh, waste products initially. But we now know that um, they have many functions. They can, they can be toxic, they can be poisonous, so toxic and poisonous, so we'll get back to that. They can be beneficial and they can have even medicinal effects and I think that's where um, we really been utilizing the medicinal and the beneficial ones in, in human nutrition as well. I mean, for ages we've been been using plants and herbs um, uh, to um, to reduce some of our illnesses, as well as that we have extracted and purified um, some of the forms. So, for instance, think about morphine, think about codeine, think about um, aspirin. They have all been verified initially from, from plant compounds, secondary compounds, and there's a big list. If you go into it, you find that most of our, most of our like pharmacy, um, comes, from, comes from plants. But secondary compounds are not there really for us initially. They are first, obviously, to have a value for the plant. So we need to first go back a step and think about, well, what kind of value do secondary compounds have? Well, they provide colors, which attract uh, pollinators. So you can see here a nice picture of butterflies that are attracted to the purple flowers. Um, they can provide a UV protection. So it like, works like a sunscreen. Antioxidants to help against oxidative stress. Um, they, can re they can have... Um, uh, special oils or odors to to avoid um, in insects. Uh, they can be to help with drought. They can protect uh, with overgrazing. So the idea is, for instance, um, um, a favorite fodder tree that I always highlight, Tagaseste. If you have ever worked with Tagaseste, if you crush it, so if your horse eats it for the first time, or if you have it in your hands and you crush the leaf, then you will smell this, this, this scent, and this scent is, is pretty much to protect for overgrazing, is to repel um, of initially insects, but also um, herbivores, like large herbivores, like cattle and horses or um, whatever wants, wants to eat them. However, it can also work the opposite. Um, secondary compounds can also be used by the plant to help with regrowth after grazing. They can be to recover from Ill, from injury, so they, it's kind of they make uh, compound. They make it, they have a compound that helps with you know they're getting cut. Um, you see this in, in for instance in trees, and also with grazing plants, uh, pasture plants that have been 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 bitten uh, by herbivores. I already said attract pollinators, which kind of helps also with um, is kind of linked as well with color, attracts fruit eaters.
So coming back to what, where can we find secondary compounds? Because people have the have think that there are only a couple of plants or there are certain plants that contain um, secondary compounds and um, or toxins and uh, and that um, these are also directly then poisonous. But if you look at this big big circle, I want to highlight that the big green circle is plants with toxins, and all plants in our kingdom. Um, contain toxins, but the quantity will really depend on the species and um, and also on the growth stage. But they all contain some form of secondary compound because it helps with survival of the plant. But the red part that you can see here is the poisonous part, which is the the smaller part. Only a few plants in the kingdom, compared to the bigger bigger um, group are poisonous. And when we talk about poisonous, we really highlight that these plants in small dosage will, um, will cause um, direct failure of uh, physiological system and metabolic systems in the animals, which obviously results to severe um, collapse of the animals um, and results generally in death, sort of like quick cardiac arrest. Um, quick neurological problems, shutdown of liver, shutdown of organs, uh, that kind of uh, poisonous. And those plants are the ones that we at all times need to avoid. I know that there are certain plants where you eat only the small um, root, hemlock is one of those, that we can just um, get an animal dead within very, very short time. So those are things that we need to really, really be um, aware of and we need to avoid, obviously, in, 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 uh, in areas where, where horses or cattle or whatever animal you're grazing that can be susceptible to that. We need to avoid those. And if you really want to know kind of the selection of those, there is quite a bit of information. There's much more information about which plants are poisonous for, for animals, but, and, and there's also a publication um, produced by Rudik um, here in Australia on uh, poisonous plants for horse, horses, and I will provide a link um, at, uh, in the email that we're going to send um, after the webinar. So I'm going to give that. That is something to just to, um, to look into and, and make yourself familiar with, but there's also, of course, uh, Google is our friend, and there's a lot of information about uh, poisonous plants for, for, uh, for horses or also for ruminants. It's generally also good to look at herbivores in general because not always um, um, a lot of information is available from, from horses. But what I also want to highlight is that plants with toxins, the, the bigger group, it is about the quantity. So toxins not necessarily is a problem. Uh, most toxins just limit the intake and cause animals to eat a variety of foods. So what, they've, what that means is that um, it, it is it's limiting the intake, so animals can eat a certain amount, and then when they get over uh, a certain threshold, they may then um, get an, a, a first reaction. Either they get nausea or they feel a bit of discomfort, malaise, and then they will, will quit with that, that eating that plant. Um, it um, it is, has also been um, experimentally shown, so this is obviously we look at uh, observed behavior of, of, of uh, herbivores in the wild or in pasture system. But you, they have done in uh, Utah, um, this group of uh, researchers from Utah State University have also done controlled experiments to show this, to show that toxins only mostly uh, limit the intake and it's not that necessarily the animal uh, will totally avoid eating it. And that's what they've done in this, um, in this experiment. It's already a bit old, it's in 1993. But it's, it's a good experiment to show where they used a um, a substitute for toxin, so they use lithium chloride, and it causes um, it causes nausea um, in the animal. And what they did is they had oats, and they gave the oats with um, one and a half percent and 0.75 percent lithium chloride, and then zero percent lithium chloride. And as you can see, um, when there was zero, they were eating you know the highest amount of um, of oats. And then when you see the more they put the the lithium chloride um, the, the levels up, the, the, uh, the less of the animals were eating, but they were not totally getting to zero, except getting maybe a little bit at the end of, of maybe closer to after day seven. But it just highlights that they can tolerate um, some uh, toxin, and in particular, 
they can tolerate it when they have a good plane of nutrition. When animals are challenged already, that's something that I do have to note, is that if animals are nutritional already challenged, they are sick, they have, um, they are challenged in the immune system, they're under stress, then um, toxins may may work a bit differently and even a little bit could, you know, put them a little bit over edge. So in a, in a healthy context where animals have additional food or they are on a good, what we call good nutritional plane um, and not sick, then they, they, this is the behavior that they will show. They will eat it, but they will limit their intake and that's what we normally see in the wild as well. So if you then think about um, toxins and think about, well, where can I find these? And, and obviously when we, we deal with pastures or we, when we talk about forages for horses, we always think about grasses and people always think that there's not so much in, in grasses and that, that toxins are mo mostly in trees or shrubs, but that's not the case. Just look at this list that, um, that, um, that shows some of the groups. So um, some you may be familiar with, others not so much. Um, and I put behind it some of the, you know, species um, that may have it. Um, and for instance, um, alkaloids, uh, you can find it in, in corn, in barley, in speargrass, tall fescue, um, terpenes, um, saponins. Saponins can, you can find in, in legumes such as um, lucerne, condensed tenons, wiregrass, broom sage, um, proteinase inhibitors in wheat. So as you can see, there's a lot of toxins out there and there's um, grasses not necessarily only contain one. They can have a mix of things and in different quantities. And um, I didn't really want to give you a breakdown of some of the, of the grasses and all the, all the toxins, but it's just to kind of create a bigger picture. And if you're really interested in, in knowing more, like if you have certain grasses, um, what the main compound is. So if you obviously deal with monoculture pastures, you may want to kind of look into, okay, I have this type of grass. What does that mean from a sec secondary compound component? Uh, because that can give you some information as to um, what you may have to be cautious with when you're um, thinking about supplementary feeding. As I said, when you offer nutrients to animals, you could offer animals a, a, a more resilient, in a way, to, to cope and, and break down toxins. So um, that is probably of, of, of interest, but I, I would not be too worried about, um, you know, finding all the categories of, of your plants. It's just to kind of create the, the bigger picture, and, 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 and if you have a monoculture, you may be interested to kind of look and search it up a little bit more. But what I want to highlight is um, some of the negative and some of the positive effects uh, of secondary compounds. In particular, I want to focus on the three major ones that we, um, that, that we may be familiar with and that we see in, um, when we're dealing with horses and horse nutrition in, in pastures. So obviously people are quite familiar that secondary compounds can cause mineral deficiencies such as calcium and iron and magnesium and zinc. Um, because they can cause, um, they can chelate, so they can bind, certain, uh, certain toxins can bind and capture the, the mineral and then it becomes less bioavailable. So that's what's happening, for instance, with uh, the pseudotannins, which are um, oxalate, and the same thing happens with phytate, which is um, where phosphorus is in a bound form and is less, uh, less absorbed. Um, this is particular more of of a problem in ruminants because of the, the ruminal uh, fermentation versus horses are monogastric, which have less problems with phytate. Um, there are tenants as well. I mean, condensed tenants or tenants um, can have benefit effect, but it can also cause this chelating. In a way, sometimes tenants is, is what we need. Sometimes horses get too much of something, too much iron or too much copper, in a way, tenants can actually help with that chelating to excrete it into the into the uh, feces. Um, take an example of a, of a of a of a cousin from the horse, which is the rhinoceros. They all come from the same order, pyridactylus, and um, sort of uneven toed um, ungulates. And rhinoceros actually, um, particular, there's two types. One is more of a browser, one is more of a grazer. And the browsing one is the one that really needs to have tenants in its diet. And they found that these animals in zoos, when they were given too much hay, they were 
um, they were they were having problems with rhinoceros dying because they were not getting enough tannins to bind these um, uh, macro uh, sorry macro minerals such as um, uh, copper and and zinc they were getting um, kind of high too high levels in their blood and they were not getting the tannins that they normally get in the wild to bind that and excrete that so we need to be very cautious uh, when we look at um, look at tannins because obviously too much tannins can cause mineral deficiencies but we may have to include a little bit of tannin to help with some of the excess. So it's kind of this tightrope where at one side it is beneficial and on one side it's, you know, it can, be, um, can have negative impacts. It's, it's too much generally is not good. A little bit is generally the, um, uh, yeah, therapeutic is, is, the, is the right term. So protease uh, inhibitors, um, you may be very familiar with here, already put a picture up there, um, sorry, one step back um, with oxalates, obviously a very common one that uh, that can cause problems is here a photo is the Cetiria, uh, Cetiria grass, but there's many, many more and I have already spoken about some of these in uh, some of the pasture webinars. Um, the inhibitors, um, trypsin inhibitors, um, that we can find a very uh, common one is in soybean. Um, which means that the protein becomes, um, well, it's not as bioavailable in, because of these, um, these secondary compounds. And we can reverse this by heat treating. So that's why we um, suggest that um, similar to uh, lupins, where we, uh, where we need to um, do a bit of a heat treatment to inactivate it to make the protein more available. Same thing with soy. Those are the com those are that's the second one that we're dealing with if we're looking at you know like feeding for horses and and um, you can also find this is not only mostly we find this in legume legume seeds. Then the big one that I think people are dealing with and and ask me a lot of questions about is obviously some of the uh, species that can cause neurological problems as well as liver damage and I think that probably some of you may have dealt with that. Um, which are um, alkaloids that can do that. So I have here a photo of fireweed. It's, it's a common one that people um, deal with. Patterson curse is another one that uh, you may be familiar with. Um, they can cause uh, failure of the liver and uh, also then can lead to some of the neurological problems or you have uh, plants that uh, can cause straight away um, neurological problems such as local weed. Um, we don't have it here in Australia, but we um, we see a lot of local wheat poisoning in New Mexico. So in the States, it's a big problem. And it's also one of the studies, um, when I looked up on, because it's not really my subject, self-supplementation, I'm, I'm more in the next section that we're going to talk about. But um, I, found, I found a little paper, uh, no, a little project on... Um, uh, on, on self-medication in, in horses um, that was done in Utah State as a small, I think a small thesis where they looked at local wheat and if animals may potentially use it as a, as a medicine. But the problem is with local wheat is that uh, horses eat it in, 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 a, in, in quantities where it can cause straight away these neurological problems and um, they don't get a warning because it doesn't work on their, on their gut. So they don't get a cue from the gut that, oh, I'm getting nauseous. It goes straight to, um, to a ataxia which um, is not registered. So there's no direct feedback where the animal goes, oh, I need to stop because this is making me sick. So the problem is with some of these um, toxins, particularly these neurological ones, they are always the bad ones because the animal doesn't get a cue. They don't get um, a warning saying, "Okay, now you have to stop because um, I'm, you know, I'm going to make, I'm giving you a nauseous feeling." Um, same thing with oxalates. That's why animals will continue eating it because the effects of calcium deficiency is over so prolonged time. The animal doesn't register till it, you know, till it's too late. And um, and if, if we're not intervening, they will obviously get quite sick. Um, so it's quite tricky with these secondary compounds. Most secondary compounds cause some malaise, but there are a lot that, that bypass that, that gut, uh, brain gut feedback and, and they cause straight problems and, 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 and we're generally a bit uh, too late. And 
Um, Glycosate, um, you may be familiar with linseed is one of those, so um, that's also where we can, um, uh, can see toxic, uh, neurological problems. Um, uh, these cyan, uh, cyanogenic glycosides um, are generally released when it's crushed, so the animal has to actually physically bite in it, and then it releases this gas, it's kind of this blue pale color, and um, it um, can cause this neurological problem straight away. But um, we can also um, avoid it by using heat treatment, a bit similar to that tri trypsin inhibitor. We can use um, heat to inactivate it. Um, so therefore, linseed is okay to feed to horses in small quantities, um, untreated, or in larger quantities, it needs to be heat treated. So those are things that, you know, by, by processing, we can actually deactivate a lot of these secondary compounds. Okay. I don't want to scare you too much on that because um, there's so much more. I think that people may uh, want to know much more about this. And as I said, I'm, I'm, I just want to give the three major ones that, that you may have dealt with that, that we are aware of. And then I want to talk about the benefits of secondary compounds. And I want to also highlight the three main classes that either we have studied a little bit or we know quite a lot about in other species such as ruminants or in humans. Because the horse, in comparison, has not been, you know, has not been studied as much in this context. There is a little bit of um, movement now in the um, antiparasitic properties due to, you know, our alarming problem of um, um, worming resistance around the world. It's not only in Australia; it's in Europe and America, um, where we really need to rethink what we are currently using as in, in products. To, um, to tackle, you know, parasites in, in horses, pasture grazing, and how we can use products that, um, that obviously are less prone, that where, where these worms, worms are not so um, resistant to. So we see a, a back step going back to basics and kind of finding properties, and that's the same thing that's happening in, in human management, human medicine as well, looking at you know, all kinds of di the diseases, um, di diabetes, that's something that I already have in this list, but also cancer and all that, all, all those kind of aspects, Alzheimer, they're really looking into, um, into uh, yeah, plants again, like going back to uh, basics to find properties that may, um, may have medicinal properties. Um, but these, these are, this is a very interesting um, field and um, I'm going to, um, we had a conference in France in June where we had a French group presenting some of the work in vitro, of in vitro and in vivo, so that means in the animal and in the lab where they looked at um, safoin as uh, a condensed tenon to uh, look at larvae development and st for strongyle um, infections in horses. And they found some promising results, but um, they, have, they have to tweak here and there some of their, 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 um, their design and the diets they were using. Uh, they were also looking at extra protein supplementation and how that affected. And uh, so I'm going to make a small summary about that in the, in, in the Horses and People magazine. Um, but if you're interested in that, um, there is also an Australian paper which did an in vitro study on some of the Australian plants. And I'm going to give that, it's a pain at all, and um, I'm going to also include that link in the, in the final email. But there is a little bit of movement happening using, uh, kind of looking in, 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 in vivo, so in the animals, looking, doing actual animal experiments to see the effect. Um, but they only found at this stage some effect on the larvae development. They didn't find on the mature worms. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a young field. I think we need more, more, more research. Also saponins. Um, so here's a photo of a moringa tree have shown to cause uh, have also have shown to have antiparasitical properties um, and there's the many many other plant species if you if you look up condensed ten tenants or saponins in in, in in the keyword antiparasitic you will find a lot of research in ruminants and um, and and also in other animal species um, that kind of look into into these properties and secondary compound properties that, that have that, that beneficial on additional effect. Um, the second group that we're quite interested in in the horse world, particularly from a performance side of things, is antioxidant defense, eh? which um, you may be already familiar with, with vitamins such as vitamin E and vitamin C, which are 
uh, you can add to the diet to to um, to help with oxidative stress, eh? like so exercising and uh, and uh, but we can also um, get them from from um, well we obviously we get vitamins also in in the bound form in plants, but we there are other uh, secondary compounds or not vitamins but secondary compounds that can have a similar effect. So. Um, uh, flavonoids is, a, is a, a very popular group that has been particularly studied in, in humans in relation to into human um, human uh, health and uh, oxidative stress and aging. Um, so, but in horses we probably look much more into the performance side rather than the, the aging side of things. Um, and then obviously a lot of people are quite interested that are dealing with horses that have metabolic uh, problems or are metabolically challenged. Uh, potentially or you know borderline or may have insulin resistance or are dealing with um, obesity um, anti-diabetic or insulin like properties is also is also quite popular in in, um, in the field of definitely in human and rat studies and you see also now uh, a move in uh, in horse in the horse world um, flavonoids similar like has an antioxidant defense has a, a action but also um, has shown to um, have anti-diabetic or insulin blood properties, uh, coumarins, uh, polyphenols, uh, terpenoids. Um, so there's quite a couple of um, of uh, sec groups of sec secondary compounds that um, that can have it. So um, examples of that are um, cinnamon. That um, uh, 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 cinnamon uh, from Sri Lanka has, has shown um, to cause um, that have that anti uh, that anti diabetic properties, uh, lowering glucose uh, levels in in the blood. Um, uh, fig as well. I'll just pull up here a bit of a list. Um, uh, so it can be the bark, it can be roots, it can be flowers. Um, yeah. So uh, fig. Um, hibiscus. Um, there's quite a, 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 a quite a list out there that um, that that uh, they are they are studying in relation to this um, um, in, into this um, beneficial or medicinal effect. Um, so I I will see if I can put that paper also. I will probably put that paper if you're interested in that. It's it's more. Uh, focus on on the human side of things because there's not so much information on on horses. But if you're interested in that, I will just um, put a link up for that as well. So there's much more out there. There's so much more beneficial, um, you know, uh, the, the compounds that that may have uh, that may protect or may. Um, of course, we we have not even touched on it. That may um, have um, that can be pain. That can be a, a bit of a Pain relief. Um, I mean, opium is one of those. The poppy uh, that that we that we can yeah that we have been using to um, to purify um, morphine and um, and and all those all those kind of pain relief medication. So even horses um, have shown to to some form um, take plants that may have this pain relief, um, but um, Again, this is more in the context of, of wild horses. I, I don't know. I don't. I'm not familiar if there's any um, um, controlled studies, uh, except from this self-medication in, in horses with local wheat, um, which apparently has a bit of medicinal properties. Um, but they only use four horses, so you know, like the, the the there's not enough there's not enough studies really to to be 100% sure. Um, but um, if we assume that animals have um, nutritional wisdom and also um, can um, alleviate potentially uh, discomfort, then you would um, potentially see, similar to, to primates and other animals, this um, search for potentially painkillers in a way. Okay, so that leads me to the second section, which is, okay, so we know that we have all these components in, in plants. And, and talking about then the well, I'll lead already into that. Uh, the nutritional wisdom can actually animals do actually animals have this nutritional wisdom that they can use plants to medicate themselves? And well, first we need to kind of talk 
in terms of um, nutritional wisdom, and it's based on the notion that animals inherit a knowledge or can can learn from other animals what they what they should eat. And research on the mechanisms of uh, nutritional wisdom has significantly um, has significant implications for how we manage animals and ultimately the quality of animal and human health. So um, this nutritional wisdom concept was first really kind of um, it, yeah, and a kind of ignored or frowned upon in the animal kingdom. It was only kind of associated maybe with with humans, or maybe with cognitive function in a way. But um, over the years, we we see with controlled studies and a lot on on wild studies um, that animals um, yeah do have this nutritional wisdom. So that kind of brings me to this slide, which is kind of the historical view, and the uh, and the um, and the more contemporary view where we now kind of are probably more aware that it's it, it probably more of a learned behavior and experience that animals um, um, base their, um, their diet selection on and, and therefore also potentially self-medication. But there are also animals and there's still a lot of researchers that um, are of the opinion that or believe that it's only um, something that, that comes from an innate uh, response, an instinct that, that that animal is genetically programmed to recognize in, in, um, the, the need for, for instance, nutrients or um, uh, an innate desire to restore this equilibrium, whether on this side, so in the more, well, kind of modern view, is that animals um, will learn, so they are genetically programmed to learn about feedback mechanisms, so knowing about toxins and and, and, and flavors and uh, nutrients, and that these experiences shape their food preferences, um, and that um, and then learned is a function of context, and that that changes that changes constantly. So because the environment can change more, um, so one view is that it's all innate and it's there, and animals will utilize it, and animals don't under or over consume, and they know exactly what they're doing, and everything is wired perfectly. Um, and that there is no, and there's no in this old view. There's no appreciation of individual variation, and they also have not recognized the social learning and cultural aspects of um, of, of kind of this nutritional wisdom. But on the more um, kind of modern view or the current view is that we we do see that animals may overeat or undereat, um, and that they respond much more to excess or deficiencies. And that makes also much more sense, particularly if, <laughs> if you're dealing with horses. Um, they either overeat or undereat, um, and this is something that we see in ruminants. And also that individual may vary depending. On, I mean, like us, our requirements, our nutritional requirements, are really different. Um, and so that's also something that we we see in animals. We can have a full brother and a full sister um, horse, and um, and they will um, they will have different you know, different requirements um, and different tastes. Um, obviously, different aspects, of course, of how much we do it and, and female, male, but uh, we need to really consider the individuality in, 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 um, in how animals, yeah, select their diets and, and in relation to this nutritional wisdom. And also in this um, more modern view, so over the last years of research, we also have really, um, shown in studies with goats and sheep and, and cattle that social learning and culture are critical for this learned uh, nutritional wisdom. So it's this uh, passing on of, of knowledge. And we even know that it can happen in utero. So if uh, you is eating a certain plant, it already kind of primes the, primes the lamb to be more tolerant to that plant with that secondary compound. So it's, it is it is much more than um, just innate um, because it's it's probably um, also a learn um, much more about social um, and cultural like peers and 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 their herd behavior and that was that's particular that's something that was particularly observed when they were looking at self um, self supplementation uh, with um, with uh, with sheep in um, in these rangelands and they found that they had um, they have these ruminants, um, they have four groups or five groups, and um, one group were um, starting to show behavior of eating wood rat houses, 
and they were all soaked in urine and they found that the animals were a bit protein deficient so they were using uh, non-protein, um, non, um, uh, uh, like the kind of the urea as a non-protein source to alleviate um, their nitrogen deficiency, whether the other groups had not learned that. So it was um, um, one, of the, one of the animals was potentially um, showing this, um, this searching behavior and started eating it and getting a positive feedback and then it kind of transferred to the, to the other herd in that, in that paddock, but it was not transferred to the others. So those, those, are ex, those are observations and also experiment that they've shown that the social aspect is very, um, very important in self-medication. Self so it's, it's not clearly only innate, it's probably partly innate and it also depends on the species. So birds seem to be having much more genetically programmed versus ruminants because they're dealing with a ruminants or herbivores like horses they're dealing with a much more complex environment and a much more dynamic environment um, with uh, pasture plants. So there, there's not much more to learn about what to eat and not to eat. And that brings us to, well, how do animals then register uh, these nutrients and toxins? And that is all by this uh, post-ingestive feedback mechanism. So it's about the gut and brain feedback. And um, animals will um, have a liking for a food uh, when it when the nutrition when it, when the nutritional plane is adequate when they you know meet their nutritional requirements, but when it's low when the energy or protein or minerals are low then it may decrease their liking for food and the same thing happens for uh, toxins. So when the toxins are high, it will reduce uh, reduce the, the 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 preference and the palatability of uh, of eating uh, that type of uh, plant or food. And when it's low um, or just adequate, they can deal with it, then uh, the palatability um, um, will increase so they will uh, prefer the food. So they can handle um, secondary compounds, but it needs to be uh, weighed up against how much nutrients does it give. It, I don't, unless it's medicated, so unless animals are, are specifically looking for certain plants for the sec, you know, to, to get some um, um, uh, prevent or reduce some of their like like malaise or like being ill, um, they generally tend to prefer plants that are nutritious, that, that, that meet their requirements or have a pleasant experience. So the hedonic value right, that we talked about, so flavor. And then they weigh up the secondary compounds. So they can then have some, as we talked about it already, the, the, it sets only an, a limit on the intake, but it doesn't fully um, make, make them um, reject the foods, unless it's very, um, gives a very bad negative feedback on the, on the gut, then they will potentially avoid it if they get quite sick, when they get quite nauseous, and, and this is something that you can probably relate to yourself, uh, if you had a food and you got super sick, particularly when you're very young, and just think about something like that, and if you are still, if you still avoid that food and I, uh, I met a couple of people that for instance don't eat fish because they had some very bad experience when they were younger and they still don't eat fish. So that's kind of what we also see in animals, it's, it, it can happen but overall because of the plant kingdom because there's always toxins in there they seem to be more adaptable and, and seem to then try again because also the seasons may change the, the toxin um, level so in, in spring it may be um, it may be a bit, um, bit low or high depending on what type of plant and then at the end of the growing season it's high or low and they may switch uh, their preferences. So those are uh, things to, to, con to consider. So it's all about the nutritional wisdom is, is, is about learning and this learning is facilitated by post-ingestive feedback. So between the gut and the brain about nutrients and toxins and also the, the hedonic um, experience, so the flavor experience. And then with, when we come to self-medication and um, uh, so pharmacognosy is a behavior that, um, yeah, that non-human animals apparently um, can apparently self-medicate and the term comes from the Greek root su, pharma and nosi, so knowing. And, um, and it's, it is, it is a, a, a quite interesting field and there's quite a bit of, um, if you just type in this, um, this term and, um, and just self-medication in animals, you find a lot about wild, 
wild animals, and it's it's quite fascinating uh, just to read, not necessarily about about horses, but so just in, in general, um, what what comes up, like for instance, African elephants uh, induce birth by chewing on leaves of particular trees. Um, in North America, brown bears make paste of a root and saliva, which um, they run through their fur to repel insects and and suit bites. Um, those are very interesting behaviors, or um, even worms, you would not even reckon, but tobacco hornworms ingest nicotine, which reduces bacterial growth and toxicity, leading to an increased hornworm survival. Like those are all very interesting, um, part, you know, facts about um, about self medication in in the animal kingdom, um, and so it kind of has, you know, also a big movement in horses, and I think uh, that's also where a lot of um, um, uh, People are interested in in, in herbs and in uh, in um, well in oils and and remedial kind of therapies, and so I kind of see it more from a foraging point of view. Um, so like like whole foods in a way, um, but obviously you can use herbs as a supplement in in diets. But in this presentation, I'm kind of focusing much more on the on the on the pasture side and on the on the on the um, Full, like the, the the bigger picture of management, I think, and diet selection, and and so when we watch animals forage um, for food in nature or in pasture, uh, we should ask: um, Are they visiting the grocery store or are they visiting the pharmacy? And it, it's a kind of interesting um, interesting uh, concept if you now look at your horses and see them um, eat certain foods, eat certain plants, parts. Um, what are they selecting? Are they selecting for nutrients, or may they select for flavor? Or are they selecting for potentially secondary compounds? Um, so yeah, so self medica self medication and supplementation. I kind of put them in two categories because uh, one is more about um, to reduce um, a drug, or they can use um, they can select, ingest, or topically apply plants, soil, insects, or uh, drugs to maintain or return to homeostasis or to stabilize its health. And then the other, this more supplementation, is where animals actively ingest food or items or parts to prevent or reduce harmful effects of, of toxins or alleviate these nu uh, or nutritional deficiencies. And um, for instance, um, uh, here is, uh, for instance, the, the sodium sodium ingestion behavior of licking licking blocks and uh, licking rocks. Here, there, I got that. Already in a um, in a um, in a figure. Um, so these are some of the behaviors. So talking about self-medication in horses, and there may be many more behaviors that you have observed, and um, and it will be interesting to know. So maybe you can type in uh, some of the interesting behaviors that you may want to share, and that we can discuss at the the end of this of this presentation. But here are the the five main ones that most people are quite quite familiar with um, browsing, um, eating dirt, um, specifically selecting uh, legumes or forbs, or we would say maybe selecting weeds, um, even though there is enough pasture availability, they may search out certain legumes, or you may have seen them select certain certain forbs or yeah, weed type of plants, bad chewing, and then licking rocks, which kind of relates to that, that mineral block in the previous uh, previous picture. Um, it is something that we can facilitate, so self-medication um, is something that for horses that we can facilitate. Um, there's, there's not a lot of research done, as I said, in, in self-supplementation um, self and self-medication in horses compared to, as I said, ruminants and, and primates and um, rats. Um, so. As I said, the only one I came across is this as local wheat, and there are uh, people that have done blogs and 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 made reports and uh, and um, and and of course have observed. But I think that we don't have a lot of controlled uh, controlled studies. But um, but we can still facilitate it. I think that um, it's obvious that the behaviors that we saw in the previous ones, um, animals may may search for something, may alleviate something like a deficiency. Or it may be indeed medicinal. Um, it is, of course, hard to um, 
kind of decipher unless we, you know, we we have a controlled study or um, we are no, we are for certain that the horse, um, have, you know, is is deficient in something. Um, but self self supplementation, self medication, we we can facilitate for it, so the animal can really um, uh, have free choice and 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 can show this kind of self supplementary behavior. So obviously pasture, so having access and availability. And obviously, as much as possible, have biodiversity. You're already offering uh, your horse um, different nutrients, different secondary compounds, different flavors that the horse can mix. Roughages, think about um, free choice and uh, a variety of forages. We already discussed this quite a bit, in particular in, in horses with in confined spaces, either in uh, paddocks or in um, in stables. Thinking about the mineral supplements, so the salt lick blocks, I think a lot of people already apply that. Uh, supplementary feeds, um, flavor variety, I already spoke about that, using smell, taste, or texture to change that in the diet or offer two types of food um, to, to, um, with two different um, non-nutritive flavors. Um, we have shown that horses respond quite well to that, but you don't have to then change the um, the nutritional kind of the, the formulation. So yeah, you can create variety without totally upsetting the, the you know the nutritional component. You can also um, think about nutrients, um, offering a supplementary feeds, um, having a good nutritional plane will help, as I said earlier on already um, mentioning that that will help with uh, coping with secondary compounds. Um, so supplementary feeds do play a, a quite a good, uh, important role in a way um, to, to help with um, secondary compounds in, in challenging pasture situations, particularly in monocultures. Um, as we already spoke about the oxalate, the, the high oxalate in, um, if you have a C4 tropical dominated pasture. And then for the trees, um, one of my interesting um, pet projects, um, edible fodder in pasture or in cut and carry, as you can see here. Um, giving it a supplement already as a supplementary feed rather than having horses back, you know, like ring back your trees and things like that. So that's kind of a safer way, and also then you can give them uh, edible trees that um, that are maybe safer that you know the secondary compounds of, and you know how much you can feed. So um, that is something that to take in mind, and variety is very important for because um, animals are really um, dealing with this um, satiety malaise continuum like we do it we have it as well you don't want to eat everyday pizza you will get satiated on it and after four days you will go oh, I had enough of this and that's a protecting mechanism because it tells us that we get only one nutrient or two or three nutrients and it's not you know we need something else we need um, we need now broccoli or we need now uh, something you know something to balance our, um, well, we had too much fat, we may have to have more dietary fiber. So that is exactly what happens in, in, in herbivores. They will, um, nutrients and toxins both can cause a satiety. So if they have too much of protein, they don't want to shift to carbohydrates. If they have too much of tannins, they may want to have, uh, they may want to have uh, more saponins or they can deal more better with saponins. And we see that if you have a variety of toxins, they can deal much better with one toxin. It's kind of a complementary thing. So if you have a little bit of terpenes and a little bit of saponins, it may kind of level the toxicity of one over the other. However, it can go also the other way. So one toxin could um, uh, actually cause more problems if you put it on top of another one. Um, so those are things that um, that animals try to protect themselves against by having a variety of food. So never offer animals, you know, one type of food that therefore monocultures doesn't make sense. If you look at nature and you look at their dietary behavior, you look at their um, uh, the, the, the reasons, the behavioral mechanisms why they, they eat a variety of foods, it doesn't make sense to have monocultures. It's probably the worst you can do for herbivores. Um, and satiety is mild to strong and, and that is causing these food aversions and that is made, that changes the diet. But it's, it's generally just um, a day or two uh, and they may come back to it. So it is about these um, dynamic um, 
reset moment. It's like this homeostasis in a way where they um, they had enough and then they switch to something else and then they alleviate that and then they want to go to maybe a more protein diet or more to legumes and then they switch back to grasses. So and we need to take in consideration that the satiety theory is not alone only about nutrients and secondary compounds but also for flavor. So animals can have an, an also a hedonic effect and they eat something because just of the pure pleasure and um, horses are a great example of that. If you offer them um, something sweet, they you know they generally like um, like that taste and they, they can quite quite um, in a way addicted to it and, and anticipate for for instance our sweet foods and things like that. Um, but we should try to offer variety as much as possible um, in our pastures. If we give a bit of supplementary feed with a bit of a sweet taste, that's not a problem. It's when we offer animals a monoculture of just you know one pasture species, that's when we, we're um, putting animals really at risk, and not only for the secondary compounds, but particular from nutrients, so overeating, um, obesity, those kind of things. Therefore, we would like to see more you know pastures with biodiversity have um, you know more native pastures that are lower in non-structural carbohydrates. Not to say that we cannot have um, imported grasses or improved pastures, but it's about the balance. It's about um, having enough um, um, variety of species that are low in nutrients and high in nutrients so that animals can mix and match, which is which is hard. It's not easy. Um, but that's you know that's the ideal situation because then we offer um, different nutrients, different flavors, and different secondary compounds. Because um, native grasses are also lower in anti-nutritional factors because they have not evolved with um, large herbivores like, for instance, the African grasses and the South South American grasses have. So those are also things to consider. That's also one of the reasons why a mix using native pastures would be more beneficial, not only from a nutrient point of view, but from a secondary um, point of view. Um, however, it does affect the flavor. Typically, if you give horses improved pasture versus native pasture, they have a tendency to obviously like the improved pasture because it is um, has much higher nutrients um, and um, generally it has a more sweeter or more pro high protein level. So our pasture management goals are indeed reduced monoculture. I think that is very clear I'm saying that in most of my workshops, reduce high oxalate species. So particular, that is then more linked to monoculture. Um, it, this is maybe more a bit more for the people that are dealing with, um, that are in subtropical or tropical regions. Um, but um, it's not to say that you cannot have um, oxalate um, or spatial species with oxalate. It's then you need to obviously have a variety that you just don't have, for instance, only one with high, but have one with medium, low, high. And obviously, you need to really think about your um, the additional supplementation of calcium and um, and not only calcium but also phosphorus to um, to to balance the uh, potential mineral uh, deficiencies that may arise. But it depends on you know how much um, how much of your pasture is is um, um, contains these uh, oxalate uh, species and and then the the, the type the high, the high uh, accumulating ones such as Ceteria, um, those are things that you need to um, take in consideration. Um, weed control, obviously we already talked about fire weeds and, and Patterson curse and obviously we need to think about weed control because having a lot of past, a little bit of Patterson curse that's okay, they can, can deal with that. A little bit of fire weed they can deal with it. But if it's if it's something that is more obvious in the pasture um, and in its it could almost become a monoculture, then we're really putting horses at risk. So we really need to think about succession, we need to think about um, pasture management to, to reduce um, yeah, those, those, those weeds. So it is also about weed control um, and in the end it's about choice obviously if we do it all well, more research availability and don't forget for the trees and shrubs as, as, a, as a supplementary diet. Um, we need to take in consideration that if we do pasture management um, or there are certain aspects of, of pasture management or climatic factors will really affect um, secondary compounds. So nutrient stress, so when the pasture doesn't get enough nutrients, um, it, it, it can cause um, an increase in secondary compounds. 
um, or um, if we fertilize it, it can cr increase um, too much fertilize, too much nitrogen has shown to increase, for instance, oxalate in certain pastures, in certain species. Um, pH can affect it. By adding minerals, we can either um, reduce it or we can uh, we can increase it. It depends so much on the type. If we're dealing with a saponin or a ter uh, uh, terpene uh, or an oxalate, drought, water stress has significant effect. High and low temperatures, so for instance, freezing, salinity, UV stress, and pathogen infection. Obviously, um, fungi infections such as with tall fescue. Uh, ryegrass, stragas, those are things to consider. Sometimes you have no problems with them and then at times of the year you do have the infestation and that has all to do with these stresses. Uh, overgrazing can also stress pastures and, and can cause uh, changes in either the in, uh, pathogen infestation or changes in the actual uh, secondary compounds within the, in the pasture. So, Obviously, here is a photo. This is something that you don't want. You don't want to have too much um, of the weeds. And you can see that it, it almost becomes a monoculture and it's, it's kind of a whole sick pasture. So here we need to really intervene in this, in this case um, to, you know, obviously avoid um, horses being exposed to, um, to too much of, of one type of secondary compound. And I want to finalize that by kind of summarizing the management uh, techniques that we and the tools that we already been discussing in, in a previous webinar. And it's all about managing for uh, biodiversity. Um, we have to be cautious by using chemical-based fertilizers and not to say that we cannot use nitrogen, but um, excessive use and repetitive use can cause more secondary compounds. Um, it can also increase, the, obviously, the, the sugar content of pastures. Um, we need to look at if we have weeds, generally weeds are there for a reason. They, they generally like to be in soils where no grass is, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's succession and it's about um, what can survive in certain conditions. So you need to look at the, at the soil. You may have to be compact soil uh, because weeds generally grow in, in, in compacted or very um, loose soil or um, deficient soil. So those are things to consider. So you really need to, again, look at the soil. You may want to do a soil test. Um, you may want to look at um, um, decompaction techniques uh, such as um, using key, line, uh, key lining, slashing of weeds to create you know, um, more organic matter, mulching to add more organic matter, and then obviously together with composting or with manure to, um, to create more soil. It is probably not one thing. It's kind of adding all these things together, um, and then you can use it. Uh, you look at biostimulants. You can either make your own compost tea. It's a bit, it's a bit full on, and it, it is available, which can be costly. But if you if you have organic farmers around, um, it is something to look into. Um, um, you have your biostimulant that you can buy from the shelf. They are kind of seaweed based, or they're a bit molasses based, and they have. Um, probiotics uh, or prebiotics even, um, pre uh, prebiotics, potentially also probiotics um, to kind of pretty much give a yakult to, you, to your soil. And obviously to, to finish it, to be able to, to manage it over long term, you do need to think about uh, pasture planning, having enough pasture cells or paddocks that you can uh, do a timely rotation, that you try to avoid stressing the grasses by overgrazing. Um, and this is something that we already addressed in again in, in, in previous. So this is kind of bringing it, bring it all, bringing it all together. And I think um, um, it's you know it's a combination of things. Cross grazing uh, may help as well. Um, so that's where I wanted to to finish. Um, I have still my little booklet available um, that you can purchase online. We have a new events coming up. I think the next one, the next webinar is going to be at the end of. January. Um, I don't know exactly which topic we're going to do, but I will let Julie um, tell that. 